Hey, this is Josh for Retool.net, and in this video, I want to talk about 10 differences between Final Cut 7 and Premiere Pro CC that I think it's important for editors switching over to Premiere to know. Now, for the most part, these are good differences, which means Premiere gets it right. But a few of them are just differences, and a few of them are worse. So let's take a look at what those differences are. Now, I wanted to start at the beginning. So number one is that scratch disks are project-based. And what that means is every time you create a new project, you're going to see this dialog. You have to create that project, and in the scratch disks tab, you'll be able to choose where you want the project scratch disks and autosaves to go. Now, what that means is every time you switch between a project, unlike Final Cut 7, you won't have to change your scratch disks. So if you're working on multiple clients' projects at the same time, once you set up a project once, your scratch disk is set forever for that project. Now you can change it later, but you don't need to change it every time you switch projects. So if I create this project, and I'm gonna overwrite the existing one. If I just go to File, Project Settings, Scratch Disks, again, I can change this later, but I don't need to. So once it's set up once, you don't need to go back to it and you don't need to screw with it every time you switch projects. Number two, you don't have to transcode everything. And let me show you what I mean by this. If I switch to a project that I already set up, I have a sequence here and I just want you to take a look at these clips. I have a .mts clip, which is shot at 60 frames a second, a .mov clip shot at 30, a .mp4 clip shot at 60 and 720p instead of 1080 and 23976 like this sequence. You'll notice I have this little button that says scale to frame size and that just will upscale it to the size of my sequence so I don't need to adjust that manually. And I even have a .r3d raw clip. Now I put a mosaic on this because I don't own the rights to this clip so I didn't want to use it without permission. My point is that I could come in here and I could start editing and working with these clips without ever having to transcode them to a common codec like say ProRes like you're used to in Final Cut. Again, I don't need to screw with it. I can just start working. Now, there are still benefits to transcoding, things like if you're passing it off to someone using another program, maybe even better performance in the case of something like the .r3d, you might want to use a common codec like ProRes. But the cool part is you can just start working immediately without having to transcode, or you could work immediately and transcode in the background so you could get started editing right away and then just relink to the transcoded version of the clip. So it saves a lot of time. And for the most part, I keep all of my media native. Again, it's a consideration if you're going to another system that might not be able to handle all of these codecs later, like say a certain color correction or other editing tool, then you might want to transcode. The third tip is that your codec doesn't matter that much in Premiere. And I don't mean that in terms of what you're able to edit with like I'm talking about here. I'm talking about what your sequence settings are. So if I come over here to the new item button, and I go to sequence, this is something that's really confusing to a lot of new editors. In fact, it confused me when I first came over from Final Cut 7. So if I go to the settings tab, first you'll notice my editing mode is set to custom. And this is something that I set up in a preset. Once you get your settings set up once, you can just save out presets. So I set it to custom, which allows me to use a QuickTime as my render codec. Now, all that I mean by render codec is it doesn't mean is all of my media in my sequence going to match this. It means when I need to render something for playback, the render file will be this codec. So I typically recommend to people, especially people who are doing high quality final deliverables out of Premiere, that they use something that matches their final deliverable. So I prefer to work in ProRes 422 or ProRes HQ as my render codec. And that way I can use my renders from my timeline in my final export. Now by default, Premiere won't do this. If you export something, it'll re-render everything in your timeline. But of course you can save time by rendering effects earlier and then your final render will be quicker. So let me show you what I mean by this. If I just come here, I hit Command M to make a movie, and then I could do match sequence settings. And because I'm already using ProRes 422, that's one benefit. It'll already set up my render to ProRes 422, 1920, 
1080, 23976, just like my sequence. And then I can just click Use Previews. And if I had rendered out my sequence, my final render would be a lot quicker by using these. Now, if you're using a low-quality codec, like an iframe MPEG, I wouldn't recommend checking this button. So it's just a matter of how you want to work. But my point is, your codec doesn't matter that much in terms of working unless you are going to use these preview files. My fourth tip involves rendering as well, and that rendering is different. Let me show you what I mean by this. I have this sequence here, and if I hit return, which is the equivalent of option R in Final Cut 7 to start rendering my sequence, it'll start giving me render previews. Now, the big and negative difference is that if I hit cancel in the middle of my clip one, you'll notice I have no render progress. If I hit return again, and I let it get all the way through clip one, and then I hit cancel, you'll notice clip one is maintained. So what I want to show you here is that partial renders are not maintained. So if you have a 30 minute long single clip and you stop five seconds before it's about to be done rendering, you will lose that whole thing. So just be really aware of when you hit cancel. Try to let it finish up the clip it's on before you hit cancel. And then that clip and all the clips before it will be processed, just not the clips after it that may have only had a few frames rendered or part of the clip rendered. The other big difference with rendering is that you'll notice all of these clips have red render bars. Now the thing about that is in Final Cut 7 you're used to a red render bar, meaning it's not gonna play. Well, in Premiere it doesn't mean the same thing. It just means that it's a processor intensive clip or effect on a clip, and it may need to render to play back. It's just a bit more processor intensive, and it's just warning you so that if you start dropping frames, you'll know why. So if I hit play, you'll notice even though it's red, it's playing back perfectly fine at full quality. Now let's come over to this red raw 4K clip with an effect on it. And if I hit play, it actually seems to be doing fine. But again, if it were to be struggling, and it seemed to start there dropping some frames, I could just drop it down to half quality, and then it'll play just fine in my sequence. Of course, all of that is system dependent. The fifth thing I want to talk about is audio tracks. So if you take a look at my sequence here, I have four tracks of audio, A1, 2, 3, and 4. But if you look at my first clip, you'll notice it's a stereo clip, but it's only on A1. So Final Cut wants to work in multi-mono pairs, where you have the stereo split across two mono tracks. Premiere will let you put stereo, and in this case, mono, all on the same track. You can also set it to work as dual mono, like you're used to in Final Cut. The thing is, I highly, highly recommend that you don't do this, because Premiere is really designed to work either with a stereo clip or with a mono clip on one track. Now let's take a look at what happens when I adjust the dual mono clip. Now I have my two clips here, but when I drag on the handle on one side, it's just adjusting that one side, and clearly that's not optimal. So again, I don't recommend working this way. Now there are workarounds. I could select the clip, and instead of adjusting with the mouse, I could adjust with the keyboard and the bracket keys, and then they will adjust together. But if you want to do any sort of keyframing in the track mixer or the clip mixer, that's not really going to work for you. So again, I keep to the defaults and use stereo on one track and mono on one track and never use this dual mono workflow in Premiere. The number six tip is that you don't need third party tools for basic audio syncing in Premiere. So whereas in Final Cut you would need another tool to sync these three clips shot with three cameras at the same time up, let me just enable all of them, you can see it's the same clip. And it's the same action. The cameras weren't synced with time code. It was just three cameras started and stopped at different points, but basically having the same overlapping action. So I can set up a sequence where I either just have audio or audio and video in this case, and I sync the clips based on my audio waveform. So the first step to do this is I'm gonna drag my audio over. Now you'll notice another difference here between Final Cut and Premiere is that when I drag the video up to V2, the audio doesn't follow down to A2. And when I try to drag one, the other goes wrong. So here's the trick there. You take your video up to V2 and set it where you want it. Then you hold Shift, and then you go down and move your audio separately. And I can do the same thing here, bring this up to V3, hold Shift, and move my audio to where I want it. So now that I have all three of these clips stacked roughly on top of each other, but not aligned, I can select them all and right click and hit Synchronize. 
Now this time I'm going to click audio because the time code's not the same, the clip starter end or clip markers are in sync, so I just want to use the audio waveform and hit OK. And now let's just go and zoom in. I'm using the plus and minus, not command plus and minus, but if I did use command plus and minus, you'll notice it expands the video tracks here. So again, using plus and minus I can zoom in. Using backslash is the equivalent of shift Z, but the cool thing is, if I hit it again, it'll take me to my last zoom state. So it's a nice feature where it will zoom you into the sequence, but then take you back to where you were. So let's say you were really tight on a few frames, then I hit backslash to frame my sequence and then want to go back, I can do that. So anyway, back to the point here, you'll notice the audio waveforms are all synced up. And let me just show you in the video, she turns her head right here, and if I disable this clip, you can see it's the same action in the clip below it. And if I do the same thing here and go back, it's the head turn right at that point of the audio. So I was able to sync my audio without having to go to a third party program. And again, this is Premiere Pro CC specific. Our number seven tip has to do with the constantly switching tools. And the point is that in Premiere Pro, you don't actually have to do that. Now you can, and what I mean by this is, in Final Cut 7, you'll probably switch between the selection tool or arrow tool, this one, and then you'll go to the ripple, the roll, the slip tool, the slide tool for all of your basic editing needs. But in Premiere, you could actually do almost everything directly from the arrow tool. So let me show you this in action. If I come over here and I want to trim this clip, it's just like Final Cut. Just click and drag, and I'll trim it. But let's say I don't want to trim it. Let's say I want to ripple it. Now in Final Cut, you'd go to your ripple tool. But here, you can stay in the arrow tool and just hold the command key. Now if I hold the command key, you'll notice that my trim tool turns into a ripple tool. And there you go, I have a ripple edit. And I could do the same thing to this side of the edit. But the other cool thing is, if I hold the arrow just to the left or the right of the edit point, you'll notice it's a ripple edit. But if I hold it centered on the edit point, you'll notice it's a roll edit now. So again, I could do that right from the arrow tool. Now, the easiest way to do a slip from the arrow tool is to select your clip and then go to your keyboard. You could hit Command and Option and use the left and right arrows. You could even add Shift to make it go at larger increments. If you want to do a traditional slip, there's another way to do it. Now, I prefer the method that I just showed you, but I want to show you the other way, which is coming in here. I'm going to hold Command, and now I'm going to also add the Shift key so I could select multiple edit points. So I'll select the beginning of this clip, and I'll select the end of this clip. And now, when I drag on one of these edit points, I'm actually doing a slip. So you'll notice the in and out of the clip didn't change, but the media I'm looking at did. So this is maybe not the easiest clip to see. So let's come and take a look at it on this one. If I come over here and do the same thing, I could drag one of these edit points and I'm doing a slip and you'll notice I'm much closer to the Eiffel Tower now. Now I could also do a slide edit this way. So if I come in here, hold Command, hold Shift again, and now I'm gonna select this edit point and this edit point, but this time as roll edits. So now when I drag, it's doing a slide edit, and you'll see my center clip didn't change, but my two to the left and the right did. So I could also use the numeric arrows, just like in Final Cut, and hit minus 10 and do that that way. And of course, the same thing goes for the slipping method as well. So again, you just don't need to leave the arrow tool, but if you want to, you can. And just like Final Cut, you could do cuts this way, and instead of Control V like Final Cut, it's Command K, and I have a cut point there. Simple as that. The eighth tip is the difference in how copying and pasting works. So in Final Cut, if I were to copy this and I were to paste it, it would paste it to track one because that's where the footage started. Now it did the same thing here, but the reason it's really doing that is because no video tracks are active. So it's picking the lowest possible track. But if I had any track active, and it doesn't matter if I copy and paste before or after or any time, or it's just active, it's gonna paste there. So Final Cut will change where it pastes if you change your active tracks after you hit copy. But here, it doesn't really matter. I could hit copy, and even though it was already active, I hit paste, and it'll paste there. Now if I turn on V3 and hit paste, it's still gonna paste to V2, because it's the lowest active track. But if I disable activity on that track, it'll go to V3, and if I put it on V1, it'll go to V1. Of course, I could also hold Shift, 
to activate or deactivate all tracks so then I could quickly just turn one of them on. My ninth tip has to do with seeing your media in the project panel. So if I come over here, I'm going to command clip to open up this bin and you'll notice I have all my clips. Now I could turn on thumbnails here so I could see tiny little thumbnails of my clips and I could scale those and make those a little bit bigger for a better quick representation of my clips. But the cool thing about Premiere as opposed to Final Cut 7 is I could actually get big previews of my clips and work with them almost like a source monitor. So check it out. If I click on this button, which is for icon view, you'll notice I have this nice big clip here. Without clicking, I can just hover left and right and see the contents of that clip. I could scroll down, do the same here. I could make them smaller and see more at a time. I could even hit the tilde key to make it full screen and then make them much bigger. And I could do all of my basic editing within the program monitor without ever having to load a clip into the source monitor. Now, of course, you could do it that way as well. So let me just show you what I mean. Again, I could hover on the clip. I could hit I to set an endpoint, hit O to set an out point. Now, you might be confused because I have no visual representation of that. But if I actually just click on this clip, you'll notice I have this bar with my in and my out set. Again, I could tweak it, I and O. I could do the same thing in here, I and O. And I could go through all of my clips and quickly set ins and outs and just do a basic edit right from the project panel. The other thing I could do, if hover scrub is annoying to you and you don't like it, you can shut that off right here as well. To quickly add it back, however, if I just want to temporarily enable it for a clip, I could hold shift and there it is. And I can do my basic hover scrub right there. So there's a lot of advantages to being able to see your whole clip with a quick drag over your clip. Now my last tip has to do with batch exporting out of Premiere. And this is different than Final Cut because you can actually do exports in the background. So let me show you how that works. I'll come over to this sequence and just like Final Cut, I can set an in and set an out and use that as the duration of my export. So if I go to File, Export, Media, or use Command M on my keyboard, I'm just gonna click Match Sequence Settings. And then you'll notice by default, it'll use my sequence in and out. But I could also switch it to my entire sequence if I like. And then if I were to hit Export, it would do the export in Premiere and tie up the program just like we're used to in Final Cut. But if I hit Q, it'll actually send that over to Adobe Media Encoder, and I could just hit Play and start that export in the background. Now, the cool thing is I could come back in here while that's exporting, click on another sequence, and just keep working and editing and doing whatever I need to do without worrying about my export because it's happening in the background. You'll see if I go back to Media Encoder, my export's still happening, no big deal. The other cool thing is a lot of people don't realize this, but there is a way to do batch exporting. If I were just to hit Command M with multiple sequences, it wouldn't batch export like we're used to from Final Cut, but there's a way to do it, so check it out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Media Encoder up and that first export just finished. Then I'm going to grab and I'm just going to drag the windows next to each other right here. I'll size this down so you guys can see it. And this time I'm just going to grab all the sequences I want to export and I'm going to drag it to a preset. So I'll do HD 1080p 23976. This is an H.264 export. Drag it on and then it'll queue all of them and hit play and if I hit play it'll start exporting them and then of course I could continue to work back in Premiere and tweak my cuts more but the export will be from the time that I queued it not from any work that I'm doing right now in my sequence. So again I hope you guys enjoyed these 10 quick tips and we'll put them to use as you're switching over from Final Cut 7 to Premiere. Be sure to check out our new product Color Retooled which is a set of looks presets for Premiere Pro CC a ton of easy presets that you can use in Premiere and Speedgrade CC to quickly edit the look of your clips. Everything from brightness and contrast to vintage effects to things like vignettes that editors can quickly add to their clips and keep working. Also check out Relink Retooled, our conform tool for Premiere and Final Cut that will let you conform to your QuickTime media of different durations and file names than your original media. You can use it with combinations of tape name, file name, and of course you could use partial tape name and file name combined with metadata like time code and frame rate to help you relink your clips quicker and easier than ever before.